Hello friends and less than friends, soon to be friends. Uh, this is the first installment of the Monday Morning Podcast from the DJ Hookup. Uh, I'm Alex, a.k.a. Xander. This is Ken Sleeper. Hold on, pause. I just want to acknowledge the absurdity of calling my friends of like over 10 years by their DJ names. But since that's how you guys know them, I feel like we should, we should go with DJ names, right? You can do both. Okay, yeah. all right. This is Ken, also known as Sleeper. Ian, Big Once, and Trenton Trentino, who today I found out was also a province in Italy. So that's that's good. <laughs> that's good. Um, I want to tell you guys a little bit about the idea behind this podcast. Um, we call it the Monday Morning Podcast because a lot of people see DJs on Friday and Saturday night, and uh, they just think it's like a really glamorous life. It's awesome, rock stardom, and... Um, there is some elements of that, but come Monday morning, every DJ that you love and admire is just a regular person. They wake up and uh, they go to work, whatever that means for them. And so this is an opportunity wherever you are, if you're in Idaho, Trinidad, Toulouse, France, I don't know, where are you going next week? Um, in Mongolia? Yeah. What, what's the name of the city? Uh, Ulaanbaatar. Whether you're in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, you know, this is the opportunity to have uh, conversations, candid conversations, uh, with uh, some of the best DJs and people in the music industry at large all over the world. So, um, real quickly, shameless plug, DJ Hookup, we have a really simple concept. We want you to feel like you're buying DJ equipment from your friends. Uh, come hit us up. By the time you're watching this, we'll have all the newest equipment from the NAMM show. Uh, so that's thedjhookup.com. Check us out. And with that, I will uh, I'll give a more proper introduction to my guests today. Uh, I have to my left, Sleeper, who is uh, a TED presenter. He... Uh, He's a he's top type machine. Uh, you have millions of views on YouTube. What else should they know about you? Uh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> he has really beautiful. He has really beautiful hair. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, big once across from me uh, right now is uh, or 2012, right? Uh, 2011. 2011 Red Bull Three Style Champion. Um, very highly accomplished turntablist, currently an instructor at Scratch Academy. Uh, any anything else you want to plug? That's pretty much it. Cool. Wow. He's he's currently has the best facial hair of anyone in the room. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Trentino um, is uh, currently killing it. Uh, he's mixing the worlds of uh, actual music, music performance. Has a degree in percussion and uh, and DJing. Uh, has a number of successful tracks on uh, on Beatport. And together, these two gentlemen uh, make up the group Boat, Big Once and Trentino. Um, currently, you're going to get some of that percussion in the form of uh, chips crunching, but that just adds character. Don't, don't you mind a thing? Um, so, uh, let us jump into it. What kind, well, let's plug the chips. Plug the chips. Kettle, kettle chips? Kettle brand potato chips, backyard barbecue. Good kettle stuff. brand potato chips, highly backyard recommended. barbecue. Highly recommended. <laughs> They'll make you healthier. <laughs> the salt and vinegar ones are very highly recommended. Yeah. All right, so I, I want to start this off on, on a light note. Um, the NAMM show is starting tomorrow, and uh, all of us are going. Why are, you, why are you guys going? Why are you going, Ken? Hmm. <laughs> well... I think we all love toys and we all want to learn stuff and there's toys and a lot of learning at NAMM. I think I'm excited to see new toys, excited to learn new things. All right, all right. Any, yeah. any other thoughts? That's pretty much the best way to say it. Um, well, Trentino and myself are possibly going to be demoing products for rain, um, but like Sleeper said, it's like... We're gonna see some, see some new gear. Um, maybe see some performances. Listen to some speakers and uh, learn new things. So yeah, uh, yeah. The dude uh, Mike May hooked us up from Rain. 
Powerful Mike May. <laughs> Very powerful man. Um, yeah, so we're we're out there to to check out all the new stuff and and show people what we're about and hopefully secure some endorsements and things like that. Um, you know, I really want to get into more into like pro demoing products and things like that. I think uh, I have. A good skill set for that kind of thing and I haven't done it yet so yeah. all right all right and we're both trying to incorporate myself and Trentino uh, trying to incorporate like more outboard analog gear um, on top of like the traditional two turntables and a mixer setup so something like NAM is perfect so we can go see kind of what's new um, like you said show people what we're about and what we do and like that we're trying to like take traditional DJing in a, a little bit of a different direction. So let, let's roll with that. Um, what, you know, traditionally DJing is two turntables and a microphone, but I mean two turntables and a mixer or, right. or, or you know, uh, in like house music and in Europe it, it probably was more uh, two CDJs and a mixer and, and that's Chicago. real. Huh? Yeah. And, 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 and in Chicago. Chicago. Um, you know, that's involving a, a lot right now. Uh, I would say not even maybe even f yeah five years ago the controllers that were coming out they were toys and now yeah. you have like really legit gear you have like controllers that carl cox is endorsing like some pretty well respected people uh globally are are turning to some of this other gear um you know and what we're seeing a lot of i think is djing becoming more of an approach almost as opposed to a single activity it doesn't just involve like three items two turntables and a mixer so what what are you guys incorporating into into your sets you know what are you looking to do more of what have you played with tell, tell us about that um should we tell them what we have in the new video yeah so we we actually uh just finished shooting um uh, a new video right before we came out to la um and it's basically both of us have um, a Pioneer 900 mixer, two uh, Technics 1200 turntables. Um, Trentino has a um, uh, Nord. I'm using the Nord Drum 2 right. to release his control pad. So I'm playing uh, playing synthesized drums with drumsticks. Right. And, and uh, you know, kind of designing sounds with the Nord Drum. Right. And then I, uh, on my end, have a... Um, uh, of course, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, the name Korg, of it, uh, yeah, Cord Volca, yeah, Volca Bass, uh, Bass Synth, um, running through a uh, Boss Delay pedal. Um, so we're basically taking a track and kind of re-building uh, it two different ways. We're doing it one way by taking the original samples from the track and all manipulating it through scratching um, and cue points and, and, and stuff like that, more traditional kind of DJing, and then we're also flipping it where I'm replaying the bass line and he's replaying drums. Um, so we have, we're, we're taking this, this popular song and kind of re, redoing it two different ways. One more in the traditional DJ sense, one with completely analog gear. Um, so that's, both of us are trying to add kind of like that extra, more of a performance element. Like when I, when I was coming up, I mean, both of us, and I know um, Sleeper as well, like we we are all like more, we, we all approach DJing as like a show, not just like a, a, a guy standing up there playing records for, you know, for drunk people to dance to, you know. So like this is like the next kind of like step and like kind of going beyond just that traditional setup and trying to do some new, do something new. So, so uh, explain that a little bit more. You said you're, you're using analog equipment and then... Uh, Explain that, that more. Like you said, you're you're remixing songs two ways. Um, I, I think a lot of people might want to hear more about those two ways. Yeah. So the song that we're um, the song that we're um, we're we're taking was was basically it's like a, a a popular house song, but it was made from like two different. It was made from samples of two different, three different tracks, two different tracks. Um, so we are like so in in one part i am taking the drums from the original we both have basically we both have copies of of uh the vocal like the acapella track i have you both have copies on of, on your turntables yes okay um in serato, yes. on, in serato right in serato. yeah okay. we would scratch live 
Um, so we both have the uh, copies of the acapella. I have a copy of the original track where I'm basically picking out drum hits, um, two different kicks and a snare from the original track. Mm -hmm. And so I am replaying the drums with scratching and also doing cue point stuff with our with the dicers. Um, and uh, and then uh, he also has a copy of the um, of the vocal. And he's also running uh, a loop of like the the uh, of a bass line. So that so we're both basically taking those parts, putting them together. That's like the first half of the of the video. Then the second half of the video is we're basically stripping all that away, except for just the acapella vocals. And we're playing. I'm playing the bass line. He's replaying the drums live on analog gear. So we're basically like setting aside the turntables momentarily and just playing just strictly on analog gear so, you, so, so it's two different we're, we're taking one song and we're kind of redoing it two different ways so the first time you guys are doing it it's like you take the bass song and then you put like elements on top of it you like embellish it sort of but the second time well you, we're using the samples that were used in the song so we're sort of reconstructing it gotcha with the basic elements of, of the track but the second time you guys are acting almost like a like a band Right. And it just so happens to be that the singer yeah. is an acapella. But it's all, I mean, it's all combined into one thing. And yeah, it's not right. just, uh, it's not before, just before this we, and then that. Before we lose like, anyone bro. else, where can people go and see this? Uh, or or how can they find out about it coming out? Uh, well, it's, it's we're going to put it out, what? In, it's going to be on the Boat YouTube channel. Yeah, it'll probably be in a um, couple weeks. It'll be out. We'll, YouTube.com We'll all slash. be posting it everywhere. So if you follow us anywhere, you'll see it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it'll, it'll be all over our social media. We, we, all right, cool. we we'll have put, a, We'll put the links in the podcast description. Yeah, yeah, we have a Boat YouTube channel that all has all of our dual and, like, singular, like, videos on there. So, um, yeah. so it'll be up on there. So, and how about you, man? What are you... What are you incorporating to DJing besides turntables and, and mixer? Because I know one one thing I've always known about you is you buy tons of gear. Like you like buy it and not even use it that long. But I know you've always like been ex very experimental with like with different gear, even if it's just different kinds of mixers. Like like uh, I know you've had mixers that like they didn't even make that many of and, and stuff like that. So yeah, what are you using right now? I am using the Rain sixty two. Um, it's still a pretty basic setup, dicers, turntables, rain mixer, uh, but something I've been spending a lot of time with is video, and I think it, it does relate with using drum machines and pads and external instruments, breaking stuff down. People want to see, right? Like whenever you get a toy, you want to unwrap it and like look at it and touch it. And with DJing, it's, it's been, it's not an intimate art because people can't see what you're doing uh, whether when you're slowing down a record very minutely or speeding it up or adjusting an EQ uh, people can't see that right? right it doesn't look like you're doing anything right, right. Uh, but with video it you can see the record moving right with the image and that adds it's like oh okay I can kind of see what's going on and it creates this level of intimacy when people can see something moving and right there being an immediate reaction so, um, one thing that you do that I don't know if you guys get into is video DJing, and you've actually, I, I think you're the only DJ I've ever heard of that's been asked to DJ at a TED conference. Uh, and you did that, what was it, USC? Yeah. It was USC TEDx, um, and you did like a, a video DJing presentation. Um, t tell, tell us about what do you do with, with video? Or what does it allow you to do that, that you weren't able to do before? I, I think it's kind of what you started saying, but maybe you can like explain it more uh, thoroughly. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely not the only video guy. I'm sure you guys play with video as well, yeah? No. Nope. I, I haven't, actually. No. <laughs> well, it, it's built into the software that we all use. It's, it's easy to Serato. get into. Yeah, Serato. Um, I think uh, one of the most powerful mediums is, is music combined with visuals whether that's like a band or like a singer using her mouth as an instrument um, so when when you have like a visual and music combined for example in film it that's like I think it's one of the most powerful arts art, art mediums and I think that's what video DJing allows you to do it allows you to tell a story both audioly and visually um, 
we imagine things to go with music. We, we imagine things that go with film, and uh, it, it's like the perfect partnership, I would say. Uh, and you I, actually made like a full video DJing mixtape, Counting Cavemen, right? Like, it, tell 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 us like how how that worked, how you made that. <laughs> Yeah, it, it wasn't a full video, I, it was a very long mixtape, uh, it was like a three CD mixtape that I spent three years on and off making, and I did a video preview, I wanted to make a preview for each chapter, so there was seven chapters in the mix, love, war, God, um, I, I can't remember what you else. You don't have to remember it, all <laughs> Yeah, just because you made it like uh, some, it once upon a, a time, ago. you don't have to remember all of it. But yeah, so I, the visual, it was so much fun making finding images that fit to every single segment of, of the mix. Where can yeah. people check those out? YouTube, DJ Sleeper. All right, DJ Sleeper, YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wanna, I wanna change directions a little bit. One thing that I know about all three of you guys and I've always admired is that a big difference between you and other people I've known over the years at DJ is that you treat this like, you treat this seriously, you treat this as a career. And I know all of you spend a lot of time uh, working on this. Like I said, it's not just jump on stage Friday night, Saturday night, get that money and, and party for the rest of the week. And, um, you know, like I said, I, th I think there's probably a lot of like 18, 19 year old kids that really probably look up to you, but they don't actually know what it takes. So could you guys maybe tell, talk about what does, what does a week of work look like or even like a day of work? I mean, I think for people like us, like we work way more hours than the average, you know, average nine, you know, person working a nine to five job. You know, like you said, this isn't just something that you can do for like a couple hours a week, like go play some songs for some people, get some money. I mean, you can do that, but you're, you're not going to last very long in this industry. You know, the people that do well and the people that like have a career are the people that put in the work. Um, and like for better or for worse now it's like it's not just putting time into getting new music and like practicing your skill it's also like staying relevant on like social media and like making sure people are aware of what you do and you know like the whole other side of like of uh you know it's like the you know um it's almost like the payoff of of all the hours you we put into it is like that couple hours on a friday or saturday night where we're in front of people but people don't realize like the other 70 hours of the week that is put into you know just put into that making sure that couple hours goes goes really well um and again it's like you know if if you don't put the work in you're not you're just not gonna last you're not gonna have a career um the reason why i mean all of us have been doing this for you know 10 15 years at a minimum at this point so um it, well, you know, it is a lot of work to, to, to have, like, a, a sustainable, like, future in this. So, so you, you talk about the, the volume of work. Talk about what is the work. You know, what, what, like, what does a day of work look like for you? Or what might it look like? Well, like, all right, so today I got, I woke up and had, like, a bunch of emails that I, you know, like, the first thing I did, basically, I, I woke up, answered some emails, made a phone call, um, and then, uh basically when I, I have a, a track that I'm working on that I just started uh, on this trip actually so um, I worked basically for most of the day working on this track and kind of getting some ideas down and trying out some different things um, but that that's like my normal kind of day to day it's like a little bit of, of, of business answering emails and making you know like doing whatever kind of like online stuff I have to do but then it's also either like getting music going through stuff um uh you know go, going through new music like preparing music it, you know uh I think a lot of also a lot of DJs don't realize it's not just about like getting all the songs you know whatever's hot at the moment like you have to get that that music and actually sit there and go through it and know really know the music from top to bottom um and that means like listening to the song pretty much the whole way through and setting um you know setting markers or, or cue points to like make sure you know where to mix in and mix out of and then like if a track really stands out to me i'll, I'll really spend some extra time with it and, and mess around with it like as far as like um you know working on like creative dj ideas for like this particular piece of music right. um 
So, I mean, yeah, it's not just like really getting music and kind of staying on top of that. It's like a whole nother thing of like you have to like, you know, organize your music in a, in a, in a, in a certain way so you'll be able to know, you'll be able to find it and know what to play when it comes time to, when you get in front of people, um, the better your organization, the easier it's going to be to like put together a set and go off the cuff. You know, that's like a huge, um, that's like a huge part of it. How about you, man? Uh, I mean, these days I'm so focused on production, that's pretty much all of my time. Um, so I'm pretty much just, um, you know, composing, remixing, collaborating. I have pe different people in the studio with me almost every day. Um, and then, um, of course, like 90% of that is mixing and mastering stuff because that's the hardest part. Um, so that's really like, that's what I spend my time on. I go through music these days only when I feel like I need to, um, just because you know I'm just I'm just focused on uh, production because that's like the only thing that's really gonna help advance my career at this point. How about you, man? Yeah, I relate with that. Uh, a lot of production. A lot of production stuff lately. Uh, I first thing I do when I wake up is I go to the bathroom and I. I try to just poop as fast as I can. Uh, don't under, my, don't underestimate the importance of a healthy bowel. Yeah, true. It's, it's important. Well, I got hemorrhoids, so I try not to stay on there <laughs> very long. Powerful hemorrhoids. And I, you know, I try to read right when I wake up. Just be like, God, I'm an idiot. Please help me work. It's been 30 rough years. I need your help. <laughs> um, and yeah, kind of like Trentino was saying. There, there's so much amazing stuff online uh, on mixing, mastering. It, we were just talking about Dave Pensato, who, uh, who's just, he's an artist with mixing and engineering. It's really beautiful watching him work. He, he always has video, new videos to watch that you can learn from and a, a lot of great stuff. So I, I spent a lot of time on YouTube actually uh, trying to learn and not uh, watching UFC highlights. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, that, that's a good that's a good point. Like I, I I do the same. I mean, all of us are like moving into the production phase, or have been doing it for a while. Like kind of you know the production aspect of our careers. But uh, yeah, I mean that's something I do a lot as well, especially in the last year or two. Is like watching YouTube <clears throat> tutorials, and not even necessarily tutorials, just like trying to um, you know soak in as much knowledge about production and mixing and mastering as. Uh, you know, as I can, because yeah. um, like I mean, Trentino said, that's like that's like ninety percent of it is like yeah. you can have a good song, but if it doesn't sound like it should be in the club, nobody's gonna play it. You know, especially with dance music. Yeah, because if you're if you're playing a song in a DJ set, it has to stand up sonically and energy wise uh, with everything else you're playing. Right. So it, it you know like for me, referencing other tracks that I know sound good is is like probably the most important tool that I have. I'm always referencing, always just listening to stuff in the studio and really trying to understand like everything that's going on and how they like got that product. Mm. So so listening to music, deconstructing it, yeah. you know, it's almost like the way the Beatles learned to play their instruments. Like they watched they didn't take music formal music lessons. They just like watched whoever they admired on TV and like looked at the fingering for, for the bass, for the guitar, whatever. And I mean, they just, they just learned to play sort of backwards. You're talking about doing the same kind of thing, but for, for dance music, for, for whatever you're producing. Yeah, more or less. I mean, there's only so much somebody else can teach you. Like they can teach you the techniques, but they can't teach you to hear why and how like the things are actually happening. Like. Yeah. You can learn how how compression works, but you have to really do it yourself over and over and over until you start to figure out like what to do and like you have to understand why you're doing it and you have to hear exactly what it's doing in order to use it effectively. Let's take a quick tangent. You're the only person here that has a degree in music. Worth it? Not worth it. Uh, For what you do today. Uh, I think it was worth it, but I could also I could go on for weeks about all the things that are wrong with music school. Um, but I think for me at the time, as an 18 year old, I needed that. I needed the structure. I needed somebody to like force me to study these things that I didn't necessarily want to study. 
um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was 18. So if you're 18 and you, you're already really good at something and you know that's what you want to do, there's really no need for music school. But, you know, it, you'll definitely learn a lot of things that you probably would never learn on your own. You could learn these things on your own, but you probably won't. Right on. <laughs> so that's why it's good to go to school. But yeah, I mean, as far as um, as far as the basic skills of musicianship, theory and ear training and piano and, and all that, like that's what that was huge. I mean, that that was what it was about. And I mean, of course, it made me a million times better drummer and um, just exposed me to every kind of music that there is. And yeah, cool. Yeah, for, like from somebody that didn't go to music school and took no musical training at all, I wish that I at least, you know, like I, I never took music in any level of school and I wish that I had um, because like if, if, if I sit down to, to write, uh, you know, a, a, an original piece of music as opposed to, to somebody that has musical training, you know, it might take me... Um, a month to get a product that I am happy with where it might take them, you know, like a couple hours, right you know, on. just cause I don't have that, that kind of formal training. Um, so, cause when I was, when I was young, I like played sports. Like I was like, I'm not right. trying to be in band. Like, you know, that's just, I was not, that was so far from like, you know, now I think back on it and I'm like, why didn't I, why wasn't I in band in like elementary school, like in, in, in all this, you know? Because you're a professional athlete now. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's why you're so jacked. Right. I was like, I'm going to play, people can't see I'm going to play soccer. Hoodie, but I mean, it's all six packs. It is all six pack. Exactly. <laughs> Multiple six packs. Right. Just yeah. cooler of six packs. Yeah. Kegs <laughs> upon kegs. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, man, I was just totally not into that when I was younger. But I wish, you know, now that I'm older, I'm like, man, I would, you know, it'd be so much easier to like write an original piece of music or like, you know, it just, you know, I, I taught myself fairly well, I guess, so, you know, just from teaching myself. But yeah, the education gives you like shortcuts. Gives yeah, absolutely. It, it speeds things up because yeah. you're able to, you're, and I mean the. I think what you should get out of music school or any kind of education is learning how to learn. So, yeah, they tried to teach us how to play certain styles and about different genres or whatever, but that was all pretty much useless. What The only thing that was good was teaching us how to learn about things, how to study things, and, and you know, like, you have to... You know, telling someone that they have to study a certain kind of music is kind of stupid because if they're not into it, they're never going to be good at it anyway. You just need to understand how to study music and figure out how to reproduce what you're hearing, and then you can develop your own style from there. So on, on the subject of, of continually studying and, and improving yourself, investing in, in your own knowledge, you just took a course on DubSpot, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I think you've taken other courses, like you worked with like teachers, tutors, whatever, mm -hmm. um, like over the past 10 years. You're 31, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean um, and you've been doing this for a long time. What, how would you describe your experience with some of that kind of, for lack of a better word, it's so gross, continuing education? <laughs> but, I mean, it, it is that. How, yeah. how, what's been your experience with that? Well, I've always been a really lazy person, and I think it, like Trentino was saying, <laughs> it, it depends on the type of person. There is a type of person that will be very accountable to himself and, like, push himself and do uh, his thing, but uh, I, I'm not that kind of person. I need spankings, and I need, <laughs> yeah. I need, like, bros and sisters to be like, yo, what the heck have you been doing? Um, uh, so, yeah, I need accountability, and... Like Trentino was saying, I think that structure really helps. If and, and yeah, like kind of just teaching you how to learn, having something to turn in every week, um, being with people that want to learn as well really yeah. helps. Yeah. Like none of us can do it alone. Trentino was talking about collabing and stuff. That that's so crucial. Just constantly finding people like yo, let's work together. Cause yeah, yeah. Even even if nothing like. Even if you don't get a good product out of it, you're always you're always learning stuff. Yeah. You're always gonna learn something new. Anytime like two producers are in the same room together, somebody's learning something. Always. Yeah. 
I, I've learned a ton of about production just from from working with Trentino. Just from you know, like every time we just sit down in the studio together, it's you know, I learn you know new things or just new approaches on you know uh, what's cool about production or music in general is you can whatever way you take to get somewhere, like you can do a, you know you can you can do something a million different ways and the outcome can can be the same. So like even if me and him sit down to like work on a specific sound whether it's like a drum sound or bass sound or even some kind of groove or like idea i might go about it this way he might go about it another way and we both then kind of learn a new route to take as far as getting like the sounds that we want so um i think anytime two yeah like you said anytime two um somewhat competent producers or djs are sitting in the same room together yeah, like they're gonna get yeah it doesn't yeah. doesn't matter you know, everybody's going to learn something new. One of the things I think has always really been interesting about DJ culture is like, uh, did we already say that this is your bedroom? Did we say that? <laughs> we're, we're, we're sitting we're sitting in Ken's studio, which also doubles as his bedroom. But literally, I mean, there have been times like this, you know, like 10 years ago, where we were in my like college apartment and, you know, like we were just like teaching each other scratches. And I think, uh, you know, it, you really can't, can't kind of underemphasize the importance of the community in DJing. Yeah. And you know what? To to right when you were saying that, I realized something that all of us have met, or at least I've met all three of you through DJ battles. Yeah, yeah, totally. I met you at DMC, and I met yeah. both you guys at Guitar you Center battles. I did win all of them. <laughs> not not DMC, no, but um, yeah. Um, I rem and I remember funny enough how our friendship started is i remember the routine that you did you you came out of chicago dmc yeah, and right. murdered this and you murdered your set and i was like dude that was really dope um i th think you used like an ice cube track for your intro and i was like that's like my favorite song ever that's awesome and from then on we've been friends for yeah. 10 years you know it's crazy yeah. so i actually saw sleepers videos years before i met him and like uh, I still think like some of those early videos from I don't know oh eight oh nine or something are like still so ahead of yeah so ahead the of their time, time. like yeah. uh, just the way that he uses Serato um, is unlike anyone else I've seen and like yeah. that was a huge influence on me like yeah. uh, as far as like as far as like creative ways to play club sets party sets yeah because you know obviously there's a million videos of people doing dmc styled stuff and yeah that's amazing but you know by the time i was out of college then that was when i started getting into actually playing parties and like seeing creative stuff like that was like a huge huge influence on me yeah for sure so since the, since the spotlight is on you right now how much how much of that creativity that performance um how much thought do you put into like, oh, what does someone want to see me do? How will people react? And how much of it kind of comes from like a, from an internal place? You know what I mean? Just like a really internal inspiration versus like thinking about yourself at a party, you know, however hundreds of pairs of eyes looking at you and, you know, thinking about how they'll respond. You know, like what's what's the difference between, between those two kinds of inspiration? Um, what would you say fuels you to to create the kinds of things that you create especially like you know mixing the the performance and the visual element well i mean <laughs> so, so you want me to simplify okay okay the, simply put how much is it thinking about them and what okay. they want to see and yeah. basically pleasing the crowd and how much of it is is this is what I'm feeling yeah. and because I'm so passionate about it and I love it so much and it comes from such a pure place that's why they're gonna resonate with it how, how much of it is that yeah no that's a good question uh, I mean well first of all I'm, I'm crazy inspired by both of you uh, like tenfold so uh, I think that's a big part of it is like man, I just saw Big Ones do something nuts, or I just saw Trentino's three style video. Um, it, it, it's like food, man. It's like artistic food. And it's so rare to get um, good 
good food that you really love. <laughs> and, uh, and when you taste it, you're like, ah, oh, I love you. Thank you for feeding me. Um, as far as when you're creating something, I think, I'd love to hear what you guys think. I think, I mean, to me, it's like we, we all have this urge as artists to create something that, that lasts, you know, that, that is timeless and that speaks, that, that has a voice that, uh, that's completely unique, that says something and, and that, that will last. So I think that's kind of like the biggest thing when I'm creating something. It's like, man, I want this to, to, la to, to be uh, timeless. I, I don't think I've done that, but uh, <laughs> that, that's like the inspiration. You, know, right. you, want, you want to talk to someone forever. You want to like leave something. Yeah, that's... You want to make Biggie hypnotize. So you can listen to it like a million times in a row and just still be like, this is amazing. And then do it We're again, like, do it again 15 years later and still be like, I can't believe this is so amazing. So Ian, you are, you are in an interesting position where you're an instructor at the Scratch Academy in Chicago. Yes. What? Well, I, I had to take last semester off and they're, we're on like a break right now, but yeah. Uh, so well, well, tell tell us about your what were you doing there? What were what, your instructor? What does that mean? So, um, Scratch Academy, like uh, they opened in Chicago t a little over two years ago now, and um, I was the first person, um, uh, myself and Toad Style, who if you, if anybody listening right now, just Google the name Toad Style and prepare to be your mind to just melt. Um, we were the first people hired. Um, so basically, like, Scratch Academy is just a, a DJ school that we teach all levels of DJing. We teach, like, very, very beginner uh, students all the way up until we've had, like, very renowned, like, professional club DJs that come in to take either scratching classes or, like, advanced mixing classes to just kind of, like, sharpen um, their, their, their skill set. Um, so we've had like students as young as like I mean I think our youngest was like twelve, um, all the way up to people in their um, late fifties. Um, so it, it's really cool, and I, I you know it kind of sounds corny at this point, but I feel like I've learned a lot from my students. Like because you you'll get you'll get some students that like have never you know like a, a 16, 17 year old kid, um, you know like and that that's about at the time that I started. And they'll they'll have like an idea of how like either like two songs could go together or like the way that they think like that you sh you should be like scratching a record or just their idea. Everybody' idea and view of music is very different. Um, and I think that even you know somebody that doesn't necessarily have a lot of training like they'll have everybody has like r really kind of random and cool off the wall ideas. And also just everybody's like taste in music is different so I mean for me it's been really cool to be there and like you know um, kind of soak in knowledge and just ideas from other people that's almost like my music school at this point even though I'm the one teaching it you know uh, that was actually um, my, my next question like what you said you you've you know you've learned a lot from them different perspectives there's you know a lot of people say that you know like that uh, you know sometimes a, a professional or a veteran has a harder time than a complete rookie because you know the rookie doesn't have all the baggage they don't have yeah. all the ideas of, of yeah. how, how it has to be done but you know what would you say has maybe surprised you the most or what have you learned by teaching them um, you know like what what are would you say maybe some like major takeaways that someone that hasn't had that experience um, that, um, that you've, ta you've taken away I mean just from from my perspective like uh, aside from kind of just random like technical ideas like just just uh, like the amount of dope music I've gotten from my students is like insane like you know because a, a lot of times you know like and a lot of times this this music comes from you know younger kids like high school and even a little bit younger because I mean honestly those are the ones on the cutting edge like we're all mad old at this point like we're you know like and the funny these thing kids are like you know they they have their finger on the pulse of what and I feel like even though all of us are like late twenties early thirties like we obviously in our in our um, you know in our uh, business we have to. Keep, you know stay relevant obviously and like always know what's hot but you know you know the the you know 16 17 year old kid that's a junior in high school like 
they they're gonna know about stuff before we will a lot of times. So. so it's funny you say that. I have uh, my brother is eight years younger than me, and if it weren't for him, I would have probably never heard of Odd Future. I would have never heard of Disclosure. I would have never yeah. heard of like I don't even know like like so much probably. 90% of the music that's come out in the last five years. Yeah. Um, so if you're seven years old right now listening to this and you don't yet have any siblings, talk to your parents about that. Uh, it's a great investment. <laughs> it is a great investment. It's a great yeah. investment to have a roughly decade younger sibling. Just True. throwing that out there. True. Um, we've been talking a lot about growth. Uh, we've been talking about a lot about sort of professionalism. And uh, eventually, at some point in your career, at some point in the game, you have to grow outside of yourself. And one thing I know from talking to each of you guys over the years is that's crazy hard to do. And probably probably harder for DJs than it is even for like for bands, um, for, for different kinds of uh, performing artists. But uh, I know you've all worked with different kinds of like publicists, managers, agents, whatever, agencies. And maybe you guys can talk about like well, don't don't use any names so we don't throw anybody under the bus. You know, we want, we want to keep it cool. Um, but also, like, let's be real here. Like, what's what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, you know, and who are you working with? Who are you working with right now? Um, and if you're also hiring, you can you, you can shout it out. You can you can let people know that that they should hit you up uh, if if they want to work for you. But I will just tell you that. If one of these three gentlemen hires you for anything and you do wrong by them, I will personally come to your house <laughs> and pee in your cereal. I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. It's, it's, it's yearn in cereal as punishment for non-performance. You might even True. keep your job. Like They're probably nicer than me, but, but I will pee in your cereal. All right, so, so um, Trent, why don't yeah, you start? Yeah, why don't you start that one? So what exactly is the question? So like teams, right? Like at a certain point in your career... You know, you you have to expand. You have oh, you have to you know so build, like help build. on the business. Side? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, <laughs> not just what are your the thoughts on yeah. side. I, I think like you know and management and uh, booking agents. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I just went through um, basically a year and a half nightmare with two of uh, what I thought were some of the most respected agencies in the business. Um, no names. No names. I mean, everyone knows who they are if they've uh, if they were you know following me over the last couple of years. But um, yeah, uh, I think there. I'm I'm hoping there are people out there that can actually do good for artists, do things that they can't do for themselves. Um, but you really need to have somebody that uh, believes in you and believes in the direction that you want to take your career, and has the ability to actually do something about it um and that's that's a lot of things that have to be in place mm. for that to make sense but you know at the end of the day nobody cares about your career as much as you do um and uh so you know if you're gonna you know release any sort of control over your career to anyone i mean you really need to be absolutely sure of what kind of person they are and mm. what they're gonna do about it because um, you know, even if they get you a couple gigs here and there, it's not worth like destroying your entire career. You're talking about booking agents specifically. Booking agents, management. Okay. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. So, are are you are you a Lone Ranger right now? Yeah. You're a Lone Ranger. Right I'm now. I'm uh yeah I'm independent until I find somebody that um, actually believes in me as a as a producer as well as a DJ, and um, is willing to push me the right way. And, uh, um, you know, and somebody that's also an, an honest person is not going to steal. <laughs> um, yeah. Are, are you actively looking for that, or is that just, like, if it comes up, it comes up? Uh, I, I'm looking. I'm t I've spoken with a few different agents and, and things, but um, I'm taking it real slow, so. Got you. How about you, man? What, what's been your experience with building a team around yourself? My, my experience is damn near exactly the same um i was with an agent for about a year and a half this was a couple years ago this is right after i won three style um <laughs> <laughs> which i still have the video of sleeper of when they announced that i won three style sleeper 
was was filming it and the reaction it's still one of my favorite videos <laughs> i've ever seen and it, it has nothing to do with me even being in it but just your reaction to that like it yeah magical, it was a magical night, night. Like, yeah <laughs> um but yeah, I, I had the same issues. Uh, I had uh, an agent that really did nothing for me. They didn't really screw anything up as bad as they did for Trentino. But um, I mean, everything that he just said is exactly right. Nobody c cares about your career as much as you do. Um, I have been on my own now for the last couple of years. It's, I feel like I've done a, a, a good job. Um, I'm the same way. I'm, I, I have a couple agencies that I'm kind of going very slow about approaching them one has approached me already um but i'm not going to make that jump into getting management and or booking agents again um until the fit is absolutely right basically everything that trentino just said um i think the whole for anybody out there that's like on the cusp of like doing something you know if you really want to make this a career and you're maybe you've been approached by a booking agent or a manager or or you're you're considering trying to go after one i think the whole key is like trentino said it's like they have to believe in your vision and the direction you want to go but they also have to get you new business um my whole the biggest issue with my old agent was that people were still hitting me up and i was still doing most of the work and they kind of weren't really getting me anything new um and I think that for somebody that is going to make a, a living off this or wants to, like, that's obviously, you know, they have to agree with where you are and where you want to go, but they also need to get, they need to take some of the workload off of you and also get you new things that you wouldn't normally get for yourself. That's almost the most important thing because at the end of the day, if you have a name, people are going to hit you up, um, you know, to, to do um, shows or, 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 or whatnot. But I mean, it's, Th yeah. That agent needs to, to go the extra step the and get you day, a new they're, business. They're, they're booking you. They're not booking your agent. Right, exactly. Right. So, but your agent should be out there like pushing for you on your behalf, not just like waiting for the offers to come in and then collecting money from you, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and yeah, I mean, I hope that there's like good agents out there, and I, I'm sure there are, but um, it has to be a really good fit and never settle i mean if any like, you know if anybody is listening like t to this and thinking about taking that step like you know make sure it's the right fit that's that's it how about you man you worked with a with a publicist have you had an agent a manager anything like that yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> that that silence that yeah. silence was so telling that the yeah. the sigh was so powerful all yeah. right no i'm sure we all have stories for days um about how painful it can be uh what well, what's interesting about djing i think is it's such it's still such a new industry it's such a, such a new art form so uh, even maybe 10 years ago uh, there was didn't exist anything as a DJ booking agent or a DJ manager. It, maybe there were a few. Yeah. But whereas with acting and and writing, there's like guilds, right? There's, yeah. Um, it's been in place for decades, mm -hmm. so there's a structure to it. There is no structure to DJ agencies or management <laughs> yeah. whatsoever. And everything these guys said, y you want to find someone you trust, and I think you don't know if you can trust somebody until you actually start working with them but um like, actually like, you don't know if you can trust somebody until you stop working with them <laughs> <laughs> that's the real test yeah um i i think yeah having having a big deep conversation is really huge like all right where do you see me in 10 years uh like this is where i see myself in 10 years five years one year like what what do you think about that and also finding someone that has kind of opposite gifts of you cuz yeah, a lot of that's times, huge yeah. yeah yeah we gravitate towards people that are similar to us and finding someone that's that's opposite is is really big as well so like instead you, of a business partner, you end up with like a party friend, and like yeah, they they totally. do nothing, they do nothing yeah. for your business. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people probably fall into that trap, where like you know they hire their best buddy from like high school or whatever. Yeah, but it's worth a shot. I mean, I, if they're willing to do, you know, like one month no contract, I would definitely give it a try if you feel right about it. 
uh, it's those long contract type things that yeah can be bad. Being yeah, bad. yeah, you're right. And also, like bad experiences are, are good experiences. You know, you're not. You know, like you. We've all, I'm sure, learned a hell of a lot from the bad, you know, experiences we've had um, with with agents. So um, that's you know. Hey, yo, what's up, dude? Oh, we have a video. Hey. Oh, you guys are recording anymore? <laughs> we are recording. Oh, all right, cool. <laughs> You're on camera, motherfucker. I was gonna ask all the questions. Yeah, yeah. No. What's up, guys? <laughs> um, you wanna get you wanna get in on this? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we have so a new. Join the website. Yeah. yeah. We have, we have, maple, we have syrup new, new. maple syrup. Maple syrup. Maple syrup. What? So why do they call you maple syrup? Uh, is there like a microphone? There is a microphone oh, yeah. right here. Wow, we're fully totally doing And cool. video. Sweet. We're professional Hi, world. Here. Yeah. Get in here. Good to see you, pal. Hello, you. Love you too, brother. Hello, this is, you this is the first. This, this is the Hi. first podcast with with a uh, bed as a set. Yeah. Yes. Peace to IKEA. Um, <laughs> introduce yourself. What's up? What's I'm uh, DJ Maple Syrup. DJ Maple Syrup from. Originally born and raised in Vermont. Uh, now I live around the corner from Ken. In Venice, California. Venice, California. Super close to the beach. All right, cool. Well, um, we were just talking about various agents and such. Are we still recording? It's uh, the thing by the to the left of enter. Two of those enter. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we're good. We'll All right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Woo. All right. We're still recording. So the fact that you can hear us is a product of a miracle. Spikes down a little bit. We could have we could have lost you an hour ago. Um, Okay, uh, I'm gonna throw out some like some business theory in terms of why why I think that happens, why so many people get screwed. Um, there's something called the freeloader problem, which is basically like if you have a general business skill set, one of the things that's most attractive to do is like find something that's already making money, and then like tack onto it, and then so that you can basically feel like you're creating value or present to them as if as if uh, you're creating value but in reality you're just in the right time in the right place I think that's exactly what you just said where you know you have people who you know they'll sure they'll manage your calendar and blah 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 but they're not bringing any new business in and I think part of the reason booking agents you know I don't want to even conclude that they're all dishonest but I think part of the reason it's such a hard time for DJs is that like if you're if you're an agent and you specialize like in indie rock bands, you probably have relationships with all kinds of indie rock promoters all over like the United States or all over the world or whatever. And that means those those people have audiences that want to hear a certain type of music and they're open to possibly like new bands, you know, being exposed to new bands or, you know, performers in that in that type of music. But DJing is kind of different because with the exception of kind of like the highest level of, of celebrity DJs, I think it tends to be a lot more regional. And so you know, and a lot of times people will go and see their friends, like, regardless of, like, type of music. And you do have pockets, like, you know, the people that are really into, like, old school, like, soulful house music or something like that. But a lot of the kids, uh, I, I'm a horrible person for saying that, you know, a lot of, a.k.a. everyone that's younger than me. But, but I'm saying, like, a lot of the people that are, like, you know, 18 to 24 that make up a huge chunk of the club going audience, probably the like the EDM festival, whatever, whatever audience, they're not necessarily committed to like a particular sound. They just want to, they just want to party. And so I, I guess it's probably harder to plug you into a festival in like Utah because that promoter probably knows a DJ that they think is just as good as you are. And plus they probably have some local Utah draw. Whereas again, like until you're at the highest level of, of sort of like DJ exposure, it's, it's, you know, you, it's much harder. And again, in that case, it's your own name selling you, not like the fact that you are going to provide a cool show in a particular, particular genre. Or, right. Or, you know, anyways. Yeah. Um, so, if you can solve that problem, if you can create the first true agency for DJs that gets them booked uh, and can grow their business, it sounds like there's there, there's some money to be made there. But don't be a scumbag, because we'll find you in Pinier Cereal. So, um, I want to talk about, 
like one one last serious thing. You said in the beginning you're going to Nam and you want to find some endorsements. And you know, in the game of getting bigger than yourself, it also means getting bigger than the club or the bar or yeah. whatever yeah. else. And you know, it seems like really the the home run. Like when you when you win, I'm it's a totally broken way of thinking about it. But like one of the highest achievements is to get endorsed or sponsored uh, or collaborate with you know one of the top brands in the world uh, I know all three of you have worked with with like uh, really big brands uh, you've all three worked with with Red Bull amongst others um, talk about what does it take to get to that level and also you know that's like a whole nother business that's a business that is not the club game yeah um, yeah what what is that business and and how do you find yourself navigating through it i mean i think we're still trying to figure that part out okay <laughs> fair enough yeah it's still you know the point's been made that this is still kind of a new industry you know like uh and um i think a lot of people at our level you know it's like you when you when you first start out djing you want to get into the club um now after you've been in it for so many years, it's like, yeah, what is that next step? How do you get out of the club and get into the the much bigger, um, you know, bigger venues or, 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 or um, you know, being seen as an artist and not a DJ? And I think that that's why, you know, like one of the reasons why, like our kind of our main goal at NAM is to like meet other equipment manufacturers also that aren't traditional. I guess whether it's, you know, traditional DJ equipment or not, that that is really the next step is like, how do you align yourself with um, reputable companies that are doing something cool and different that will also, you know, like, you know, you attach yourself to them and then, you know, that that's... That, 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 yeah. that they get exposure, think, you get exposure. I, yeah, ideally yeah. it's a symbiotic relationship. Exactly. Where you're, well, that's a good You're word. showing what... <laughs> Powerful That's words. the word I was looking for, yeah. showing you. what's possible with their equipment. Yeah. So you're helping them sell that, and then they're also helping, you know, expose you to a wider audience. Yeah. I think that's the ideal situation. I think, like, uh, like a, a really good example of that is Tractor. Um, you know, Tractor for a while was like you know like uh tractor almost and this is not like a diss of any kind um you know tractor when it came out was like serato still had like 95 percent of the market share in the united states probably yeah okay but yeah it just is a general thing like it was still serato like most you know, it was like if you go into a club, if they had any kind of like interface box, it, they had Serato. Right, right, right. All of a sudden, Tractor started aligning themselves with the best DJs in the world. They had Craze and and uh, and Shifty, um, and uh, you know, uh, Rafik and Clever, and like they would put out these crazy videos showing just just like Trentino said, it's like what's possible with that with their equipment, and all of a sudden. It, the, the playing field got way more level and they and it was just like I'm using the, the, the turntablist example but yeah. I know that they had like they had um, you know videos with other guys that were way more into the house you know like d deep house and tech house scene sure and they were you know showing like running four decks and everything yeah, but Felix what Felix and Richie Houghton Richie Houghton yeah that was the other big one but for somebody like that you know it's like you I, I feel like those videos those guys really did it right like they actually like we're seeking out the best DJs in their in their respective like scenes and be like, "Yo, come yeah. to our side, do this video yeah, for us. It's gonna help you. It's gonna help us." Respected. Right. Right. Same thing Nike did with skateboarding. <laughs> Explain Dude, that. We, we what were talking you... about that the other day. But, like Nike was attempting to get in the skateboard industry for like years and years, and it never really happened. They were just never. They just never had credibility as a skateboard brand. And then they got guys like Eric Costin and P. Rod to come over, and that really that turns out you can buy six. credibility. <laughs> you can yeah, right. be bought <laughs> for the right price. But you know, to to the point that you're making, in the case of Ni and in the case of Nike, I feel like I, I I know what you mean. Like you can, there are a lot of brands, like a lot of big brands, that try to like slap their sticker on something, where like they make it like super corny. Like I'm not gonna. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to call anybody out, but you know, like, they'll at some like nerd conference, they'll get some like 
big name DJ or, or whatever. It, but it's not like a true alignment. It's not like it's not like a real representation of of who they are or, or what they're about. It's just like, hey, come buy our stuff because we're having a big party and we have got like hot girls to dance on stage and you know like everybody he, likes hot girls yeah you know but but i think the difference with these two examples in the in native instruments and nike is like they were they actually said like what's the culture of of this industry and like what do these people actually care about and how do we pre, how do we fund more of that like on the highest level because i think i think what you end up like clubs right you can't hire a dj to do like a really artistic set that makes everybody leave, right? It's like so artistic, but at a club, people are trying to dance. They're trying to like meet new people. They're trying to like. Dude, you sound like you're going to really dope clubs. <laughs> I saw a DJ shout out. I haven't been uh, to clubs. I, 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 haven't, been I haven't sit and drink bottles. I haven't been to a club in a while. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm gonna, where are these awesome clubs where people actually dance? They exist. They yeah. exist. Gratuity in LA. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> On Sunday afternoons. <laughs> smart Bar, smart Bar Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, how about you? You worked with uh, obviously you've been working with Red Bull not because you want anything, but you've been working with them uh, as part of like an ambassador program they've had for a long time. You've worked with like Adidas, some some other brands. Uh, how did those how did those relationships come about? Um, where did they approach you? Did you approach them? How did that happen? Mm. Mm. Well, hearing you guys talk, I think. I mean, the question in my mind is like, what gives value to something? Like, what gives value to a DJ? So, for example, when you're talking about native instruments, they value um, people with like crazy talented, gifted yeah. turntablism skills, and they make these amazing videos. Um, <laughs> I, I'd love to talk about that more, but as far as Red Bull, I worked for their music academy for uh, a few years, and been DJing for them, yeah, Adidas as well. Uh, well, how did the relationship uh, come about? How did it start? I, pff, man, uh, Red Bull was, I asked the rep at Indiana where I was going to college, who, like, yo, I love Red Bull, would love to DJ for you guys, and uh, I did a snowboarding event for free for them. Both my speakers blew. <laughs> probably know the story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Shout out man. to Indiana University. Amen. Yeah. yeah. And I, I did it for free, so I was dating this girl at the time, Kate. And she's like, you're so stupid. Shout out to Kate. We all remember Kate. Shout out to yeah, Kate. Yeah. yeah, I remember Kate. Yeah, she said, you're never going to get that money back. And I, I was six you months. You proved her wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, so after six months, uh, James, James Newton, uh, owed that guy a lot. He, he hit me up. He's like, hey, would you want to DJ at the RCA Dome for like 800 bucks? Oh, damn. <laughs> like, yeah. That's almost four digits. Yeah, yeah, and it kind of grew from that. Uh, and yeah, I think any, as far as wisdom on that, I, I mean, I think find brands that value what you do, and it's very hard to find brands that do that, but um, there are some really cool companies out there that do value talent and, and art, like, I think pursuing those those brands yeah I would say right on yeah. um okay I want to do like a, a rapid fire round simple questions we don't have to get like, real philosophical on them like batter's um, box huh like uh batter's box <laughs> pensado's place kind of a really quick you know stream of consciousness thing I'm just once again say, shout, out say, shout out to shout out to pensado never even seen his stuff <laughs> but shout out to that guy that's the shit right there uh, four endorsements four endorsements <laughs> yeah um What's better about DJing right now than it was ten years ago? Um, uh, not there's having to carry records. Not was, having to carry records. I was gonna say that that's related, <laughs> but it's it's there's just so many more possibilities with what you can do musically because yeah. we're not using records. Because we're right, using right. software, there's so many possibilities that didn't exist before, and that's uh, I think that's one of the most exciting things. Yeah, technology. I mean, I think if you... Technology can be a crutch, for sure, but... Sync um, button, baby. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, everybody in this room, I know, has has really tried to take technology and really, really put it to use and, like, um, you know, to really, like, uh, to really, you know, elevate, you know, the, the stuff that, that we're doing now wasn't possible even, you know, six, seven years ago. 
Um, so I think yeah. that's the number one thing for sure. Maybe we'll yeah, being able to produce, man, being able to make our own stuff. Yeah. That's just that's that it. was something I never even thought of when I started. I just didn't even know it was possible. There was like such a separation. So being able to edit and produce and do our own stuff is it's badass. Yeah. 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 I did. I did. I did. You remember ten uh, years ago? Ten, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would say I think the most powerful thing is if if you make a really dope track, it it most likely will be known because of the internet. And We're talking about our, DJing, not producing. Oh, oh uh, <laughs> no, you, well, you, DJing producing like anything in in the realm of what we're talking. Well, about. Well, yeah, I mean it, it's related. I think, dude, there's people we'd never find out about without um, the internet, YouTube. I mean, you were one of the first. YouTube like superstar DJs, oh, and I'm not even damn. saying I'm not even saying no. Oh, that's that's damn. absolutely true, dude. I mean, like, yeah, you know, like you, sure. like, like, you know, he didn't. Trentino had no idea who you who you are. Million you know? views know on YouTube. We had friends we had in common six, till dog, later. One point six. One point six yeah. million views on YouTube yeah. yeah. last night. Well, dude, I remember. No, I remember watching your videos and being like so proud. I mean, like, and seeing the your numbers, like, like literally. I think you were one of the first. Like those first couple of videos you put out with one of the so at least that I was aware of of DJ videos that really really took off, and I was like yes dude like he's doing it he's doing it like this is this is like a whole new whole new era like a whole new world you know, um, so you're I mean you're totally right like that's one thing that I'm afraid thing. of is that there's a bunch of DJs that are gonna listen to this and then they're gonna like be like oh I gotta make a YouTube video there there's watch his videos. Cause what you do has to be awesome. Like, <laughs> yeah. like I, I really can't yeah. emphasize enough. Like, yeah. it can't be like a practice video. Like, oh, here's me hanging out in my room, just hanging out. Like, watch his videos, yeah. and and maybe you'll understand where the bar is set. Yeah, yeah. But just to clarify, like, there's also like a hundred thousand other like videos of guys that are not just a practice session, but are really good technical DJs and are scratching and this and that. Like, what yeah. separates? sleeper from a hundred other guys that are making good bedroom videos is like him is yeah like being an it's the personality yeah being for entertaining sure. to watch for sure I mean, watch anybody sit there and scratch records yeah but it's badass to watch this guy do his thing because he's performing and he's an entertainer yeah so there's something to be said for that aspect for sure all right next round what would you tell your 18 year old self that you know now that you didn't know back then <laughs> so so much <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. I would have, I would have, I would have, I don't know. Predicted the EDM wave before anybody else. <laughs> yeah, you would have. Yeah. In, in yeah. the United States. <laughs> yeah. Why? Because uh, it seemed like nobody cared about electronic music in the United States. That no, was like a nobody, totally nobody European did. thing. I I was actually relatively early. I'm still relative in the grand scheme of things. I'm relatively new to dance music, but in the scheme of the the current wave in the US I was actually pretty early I was trying to play dance music as early as 08 09 in the clubs and that I was playing um and nobody wanted to hear it like nobody never it was a failure but um you know and then by 2010 2011 then it really started to blow up but as far as 18 year old self um I would have gone to a college in Chicago instead of Ohio. Okay, okay. <laughs> Not that anything was wrong with where I went, just that it was in Ohio. Um, and I would have gone somewhere way cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right on. So the value of being I'm in a big city and the value of not taking on a billion dollars of student loans. Yeah, for sure. Those are some, those are some good ones. Ian, how about you, man? I was going to say go to music school. <laughs> okay okay um i mean not necessarily go i mean mm. take some kind of music education classes because like i like i there's no way i would have gone i went to like a traditional college like four years school i went to northern illinois university shout out to niu um graduated with a degree i'll never use uh also wasted a bunch of money um and uh, I kind of got a degree knowing damn well I was never going to use it. It was just like you a super, get, super like, fallback. You 60% of the users just drop out of college right now. Uh, I mean, listeners, listeners. <laughs> like, uh, if, you know, if you know what you want to do and you know that you're good at it and you know that you 
Here's another thing. When I was going away to college, like when I graduated high school, full time DJing was not a thing. Like that didn't right. exist. Or like traveling, you know, you could you could like play in clubs in your city, but because of Serato, they are like DBS. it existed for about fifteen people in the world. Yes, and they yeah. spent thousands of dollars to carry twenty crates of records to wherever they were going in the world. Right. So when I went away to college, that. Me being a DJ as a career path did not really exist as a um, legitimate, um, you know, career. It just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm dating myself a little bit with that, but... Um, we, we've already gone through the... Everybody here has gray hair. It's cool. Yeah, not as much as me, though. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would, I would go... Whether or not I went to music... Whether or not I went to college or music school, I would say to take music lessons. Okay. Um, or, you know, like learn to play an instrument. Like around that time, what I was like, you have played? well, when I was 18 and 19, I did, uh, I have uh, a, a bass and I had a bass back then and I did take some lessons, but, um, around that time and like around that time too, I got into DJing at like 17. So like 18, 19, 20, I was like messing around with DJing and that's always what I wanted to do. And I was like also messing around with bass guitar and also messing around with production. And I like it when I was like 20, um, I was like, all right, like. I need to concentrate on one thing. That's another thing. Because now the DJ producer thing, that's also something that didn't exist even a few years ago. It was like, you're a DJ or you're a producer. Mm -hmm. There was like a huge separation. So for me, when I was 18, 19, 20, I was like, all right, I just need to put all my energy into DJing. I want to be the like best DJ I can be and not be like an okay DJ and an okay bass player and an okay producer. Looking back, I would have stuck with all of that yeah. um, because... So you're saying earlier on you would have been you would I would have sticked I would have stuck I messed around with like um, with production and I messed around with playing bass and I'm you know DJing was always my main focus but uh -huh. I basically put production and and playing an instrument aside to focus all my spare time and energy on DJing specifically like like artistic you know advanced DJing turntables turntables yeah okay looking back on that I would definitely have. I mean, if you know, if I had, diversified I have, set. you know, I have 15 years in the game DJing, but really only a few couple years in the production game. Like, if I had 15 years of DJing and 15 years of production, like, you know, so let me, if, I would have been pulling up in a Ferrari right now. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> the uh, the Dead Mouse GTR exactly with, with the cartoon cat inside. Right. Um, I would have crashed like five of them like already, and I would just just keep you know. Peace to Scott Storch. Yeah, um, right, right. Um, if you had stuck with bass, would you currently be Flea, Paul McCartney, or Bootsy Collins? I was just going to say, before you even said Bootsy, I was going to say Bootsy. Okay, yeah, cool. I would be Bootsy. Yeah, cool. man. That's yeah. all you need to know. Yeah. Um, how about you, man? What would you have told your 18-year-old son? Uh, I would tell 18-year-old Mabel Syrup to... He yes. was called Maple Syrup at 18 years old. No. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't. That's, that, that's newer than that. I'd tell him to go to college in a major market and make a lot of friends. And DJ at all your college parties and then DJ at all your friends' parties afterwards and then DJ at all their corporate parties yes. when they get jobs at Google. And <laughs> yes. And then DJ, if you're in L.A., DJ at all their company parties when they start working at HBO and then you know a lot of people and you're kind of already on track yeah totally yeah. 18 years old there was a day yeah well thank god for maple syrup <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I love your gray hair thank you thank powerful you. gray powerful yeah, very powerful silver thank you thank you peace to Sean Connery <laughs> um immediate thought uh, stop drinking okay uh, <laughs> I wish some of my friends or, uh, I mean, my family told me, but I, I was on the path to become a heavy, heavy alcoholic. <laughs> and, um, and I think, man, I was, I, was, I was such a hopeless romantic back then that like I was working so hard because I, I wanted to be loved and I wanted to like have that supermodel wife and everything would be perfect if I found the perfect girl. Um, <sighs> And I, I think I would tell my 18-year-old self that's like, yo, uh, God loves you a lot, not because of anything you did, but because of what he's done for you. Uh, j just to know that God loves me would really change a lot of things, that, that I'm loved. 
instead of like striving and trying to fill this emptiness mm -hmm. with with alcohol and other things. And the supermodel wife. Yes. That's real. You, you could have told me. I think I think if you had a supermodel wife, you would he, totally he not complain though. Yeah. yeah. Just throw it out there. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna jump in on this one. Yeah. If uh, eighteen year old, I know, I knew, I I know eighteen year old Alex. <laughs> All right. Is that How, her? So okay, we're not gonna make this about me, but I would tell eighteen year old me is, you are dumb as fuck right mm -hmm. now, and you will be for a long time, because now ten years later, I'm still like, damn, I'm like dumb about a lot of things. But I thought I was really smart then, and then there's a part of me that thinks I'm like pretty smart now, but the smarter part of me now realizes like how dumb I am about a lot of things, and how many things like I'm still going to figure out. Whereas like at 18, I had it all figured out, man. I had the master plan, and, <laughs> right. and, and like one day the master plan just like shattered, and I was like, oh, I'm going to have to like put the pieces together from square one now. So if you're 18, just come to terms with the fact that you're probably dumb as fuck right now. Uh, and, I would, if, and if you're eight and you asked your parents for a sibling, then you're actually really smart. Really smart. Yeah. I want to know something. What would 18 year old Xander tell 18 year old Trentino, and vice versa? Because you guys knew each other when you were 18. What? But, well, we weren't. We weren't like BF, like we were, we were in the same. You guys uh, knew each other though. I mean, yeah, we were like yeah. in the same like music theory class. So okay. it's, it's not what? like it's not like I knew the insides of his like psyche where I could where I could like uh, okay. give him like. <laughs> You know, I'm not Dr. Phil here. So that question was completely out of line, is what you're saying? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not out of line. It's, it's, it's not like out of line. Uh, it's just like it would be bogus for me to be like, oh, here's what you should do with yourself at 18. You know? we, this, I'm just. I'm thinking more of like how to dress or like not to talk to that girl down the hallway. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> oh. think smaller picture. I don't know, man. I, I don't. You'd have been like, where? I don't all think black, you need. I don't, think, I, don't right. think you to, I don't think you need it to be fixed. I think I think you're uh, all right. Uh, no, because like, because when we went to high school together, like he was probably like one of the. It, it was him, and I'm sorry for I, I don't Mike Fishman. What, what was his rap name? T Scar. T Scar. Yeah. Oh, that's a T -Scar. And they were like they were kind of like local celebrities. So so yeah. Um, I, I think whatever. You were a celebrity you, when you were 18. Dude, <laughs> kidding me? You don't Buffalo Grove, Illinois celebrity. You don't even know. You don't even know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I don't know. I, th I think whatever he was doing, he was doing it right. Are we talking? To, or is the is the root of this question that we're thinking about? Like, what would we say to kids that are eighteen that are looking at doing this stuff now? Like sure, sure. But I mean, it's like it's really preachy if you're like, son, here's what you should do right now. First, first of all, we're not even that old, and second of all, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, and and second of all, it's like really obnoxious to like assume you know everything about someone else. I think all you can really do is talk about your yeah. experience, where you've been, and, and what and what you maybe think uh, you realize now that you didn't then. But let's let's jump into the third question. What are you listening to right now that you're feeling? It can uh, be new, it can be old, it can be from the future, it can be like well, rocks hitting my, each other. My listening is focused on what I on the kind of music that I make because that's what I'm studying in order to be able to make what I what I do. But um, you know, I'll say as far as the house stuff, it's been for a long time Jack Beats, AC Slater. Um I'm also super into Lido uh, and uh, Module Octopus for like crazy production techniques just to like, you know, expand your mind about what's possible, what you can or can't do in a track. Like those yeah. guys are really pushing the boundaries of like, um, of, of rhythmic feels and like space in tracks. Like those guys are, are on another planet. Um, and then like, is I still listen to some like like rock stuff too. I'm still like super into Death Cab and Vampire Weekend. Like just amazing songwriting and and performance and and uh, and engineering on those records too is amazing. Right on. Yeah. Oh, um. Sure, I mean, I like how stuff. I'm right the same. I mean, like Jack Beats. Uh, Gasafelstein is another one. Oh um, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Gustavusin Brodinski, I almost forgot, but yeah. yeah, they're huge, huge influences. Yeah, um, I think anybody that anybody that's tried to produce house music, I, I feel like most people I've talked to that are kind of in our lane, like Jack Beats, is they're they're like the kings. Like those guys are doing 
they're consistently like ahead of the curve. Yeah, and they've, they've curve. like and they've kept up with like the trends without losing their own right. sound. Yeah, it still sounds like them, but it's like they're doing 2014, 2015, like deep house, but it's somehow it's still it's still Jack Beats. It, it, you can still hear like the progression from the fidget and wobble stuff they were doing before. Yeah. So I just I just want to throw out because there's probably some like older people who probably have like similar taste of music to me who are like that's not house music i'll show you house music <laughs> and and what these guys are talking about is kind of the house music that's come out of the more recent edm era and whatnot um but you know it, it's still you know there there's obviously good and bad in in everything yeah um so cool yeah and then also like uh like i'm a huge fan of like what has become like the genre of glitch hop which is like um pretty lights and uh Cohen sound Cohen sound yeah um and uh like uh god of course i'm drawing a blank but this um dude haywire is is yeah. crazy basically like i come yeah. from the i come from the more of a hip hop background um where i like my production the stuff that i like to do and the stuff that i'm drawn to is uh very sample based so I like that these dudes, like, um, you know, like I mentioned, like, Pretty Lights are taking, like, um, and in Skrillex, too, like, people don't even realize, Skrillex, a lot of his stuff, like, um, the way he chops samples and the way he's kind of introduced this, you know, new, very micro-edit kind of style of chopping samples is, like, you know, aside from his all his other sound design, like, Skrillex is one of my favorite, like, sample-based artists because he is just, the way he thinks about sampling is so insane. Um, so I like any kind of, you know, uh, producer that takes samples and flips them a new way. And then like, um, still Jay zone, um, who's like a weird hip hop producer is still probably my favorite producer of all time, just cause he takes like the most ridiculous random sounds and makes them into just random ridiculous <laughs> records that are amazing. So when I think about you, I think I actually see easy E in my head. I mean, Easy uh, E is, uh, yeah. What a I'm, compliment! I'm a huge Easy E fan. I think that's your spirit animal. My spirit. That that's true. Like, really quick. Wow. I got my introduction to like music and what I first realized, like, oh, this is what I like, is I have a cousin that's eight years older than me, and he was giving me N uh, NWA tapes uh, and like really early West Coast rap when I was like seven or eight years old, and like from that age, I was like, this is awesome. This is all I want to listen to forever. So the rest is history. The rest is history. Seriously, <laughs> um, that's that's how I got into music, um, and uh, you know, that's yeah, that's 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 a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. Maple syrup. What are you into right now? I'm just scrolling through my iPod here. Azalea Banks. All right. Big Crit. Nice. For sure, new Big Crit album. Uh, Homeboy Sandman. If you don't know Homeboy Sandman, go look him up. That's the dude right there. Uh, Laser disc. Shout out to my fellow. Oh, viewers. nice. Laser disc, homies, making some of my favorite, some of the most tasteful dance music uh, that I've heard in a long time. Uh, we all like that new D'Angelo. I suppose that yes. doesn't mm -hmm. even bear mm -hmm. mentioning. I don't know every of single. Of course, it bears mentioning. Every <laughs> single DJ Neil Armstrong mixtape ever. Uh, oh yeah. Yes. Paul Simon. I have a whole playlist that's just called Phil Collins is a Beast. All right. <laughs> All right. I play other people's music for a living, so I listen to random ass shit. Okay. You played okay. some Phil Collins on Sunday, right? I think. At Pretty some much point. always. Yeah, it was, yeah. I remember that specifically. How about you, man? What are you into right now? Ah, uh, man. I've always uh, wondered this, actually. Yeah. Uh, this question uh, is like, uh, you just unearthed this question for my soul. I'm going to turn. I really want to know. Another what thing about Sleeper. What Sleeper listen to? Yeah, another thing <laughs> about Sleeper before you even start is, aside from, like, really being on the cutting edge of, of technology and everything, you've also always, ever since I've known you, your, your music taste has been just, like, off the wall in the best possible way and way ahead of the curve, too. So what are you, what are you, what are you, what are you listening to? So I can take notes. Well, dude, I mean, everything, like... Lido, Lido, uh, Skrillex. Uh, I definitely relate with a lot of stuff that you guys mentioned. <laughs> Phil Collins. <for> sure. <laughs> Phil Collins. <laughs> I can feel um, it. Man, it's such a... Uh, the <laughs> Alabama Shakes. They have a new album mm. that's out that's okay. really, really dope. I just heard some stuff. What kind of music? It's uh, kind of folk, indie, soulful, R&B. Mm -hmm. um, 
like, yeah, the singer is like crazy, right? Oh my yeah, gosh. yeah. Um, I really love Edit. He's yeah, yeah. I got to open for Edit a couple years ago, and my my like, dude, that yeah, that that's like actually one of. The, sorry, not to cut you off, but. Uh, <laughs> I knew I was trying to think of somebody else. It was like Edit in the Glitch Mob. When I, I opened for Edit and he, from the first, like I didn't really know that much about him. I knew about the Glitch Mob, but I didn't know about Edit's solo stuff. And like the first like 20 seconds of him playing, I was like, yes, this dude is like, yeah. this is exactly what I want to do. So, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, he, he has a track called Crunk de Gaul. Yeah. That he came out, it's at least five. Yeah, five, six maybe years ago. Maybe ten years old. Yeah. At this point, com completely mind-blowing. I still listen to that yeah, edit mm. from the Glitch Mob. The whole L.A. beat scene is really cool. Yeah. Really grateful to, to live out here. Which uh, include names from artists. Flying Lotus, Toki Monster. Yeah. Toki uh, Monster's new shit is off the hook. Yeah. Uh, the whole Team Supreme crew... They make um, these beat tapes almost every week. Oh, that wow. Really showcase really cool things. Mike Par Parvizi, Mr. Carmack. So legit. Yeah. A, a gigantic crew of really talented people. Uh, Team Supreme. Uh, but uh, the things that really get me, I, I fell in love with music through uh, trance, like old school That's trance. Right. That's right. Um, that, that, was, that was the yeah. first non metal form of music I listened to. Really? Yeah, at 16. Really? You too? Dude. <laughs> Up until about 16, the guys? only type of music I acknowledged as music was heavy metal. Okay. And, and then, somehow, I went, made the leap from heavy metal to trance. That sounds like yeah. a joke. Like, like that's like... And then, I listened to, like, drum and bass, and yeah. that brought me into, like, yeah. DJ Shadow and Jurassic Fire. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was I going to say? Trance, something... Oh, a Scream, I really like. Yeah. Uh, to his... Yeah. This stuff is so diverse, eclectic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my, kind of my go-tos when I'm seeking inspiration are uh, Jeff Buckley, Lover, You oh, Should Have nice. Come Over. It's one of the most, like, people do sound checks with this track. Yeah. It's so awesomely mixed. Yeah, that I've listened to that song over 500 times. Jeff uh, Buckley? What is yeah, it? Yeah, Lover, You Should Have Come Over. Okay. And, uh, and Chopin or uh, Pat Metheny. Nice. Which is kind of my like three. Yeah. It sounds kind of douchey, but it's, uh, I, I always go back to that, man. Cause it, it just it has layers, man. Every time, yeah. It, it just keeps it, it never gets old. Classical. And... Yeah. Yeah. So so I can probably describe what I listen to right now with four Pandora stations. Uh, one is Aloe Black, I Need a Dollar, but it's it's key how you tailor your Pandora stations. I'm, I'm putting you guys on the Pandora game right now. It's key how you tailor it, because if you're not careful, you're going to get some, like, you know, like some, like, boys to men songs you don't need to revisit or whatever. Like, you have to upvote as much Bill Withers as you possibly can. Yes. When when you're listening to the Ella Black, that's a life lesson for you, eighteen. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And yeah. and in general, you will never listen to too much Bill Withers in your life, or so, or Rufus Thomas. So get to it, Bill Withers and Rufus Thomas. Um, interestingly, I don't have a separate Bill Withers station because that station provides me with so much Bill Withers satisfaction. Uh, <laughs> then. Uh, who, by the way, is the only religious figure that I personally. Uh, uh, bow down to Bill, Bill Withers. Let it be known. Still, Amen. Bill. It's yes. on, I think it's on Netflix. Do that. Um, uh, Carrie Chandler Station, which I have, which I have uh, modified in a way where I get like classic jazz, but like the funkier jazz. So I have like Carrie Chandler and all this like really beautiful like older deep atmospheric kind of house, uh, and then I have like Horace Silver. And um, man, like you know, like Donald Byrd and stuff like that, and, nice. and that's it's amazing. Um, and um, there's a Cure and or Smith station somewhere in there if I'm in that kind of mood. And then if I want to like wind down for the day, I actually I have a Chopin station. But what I've done is I've I've basically thumbed up all of like uh like really beautiful deep piano and i thumbed down anything sounds like it might be new age music it's very dangerous when you're listening to like piano music 
it's very thin line before you get into like new age bullshit. So you have to make sure you cut all of that stuff out. So that's that's basically everything that I care about. I put you guys on the game for Bill Withers if you're like I don't know, uh, like if you were born in the '90s. Um, yeah. Anyways, that is the first Monday morning podcast. We hope you learned something. We hope uh, this was helpful for you. Cautionary tales. Um, you know, pooping rituals, all, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, if you liked what you saw today, please share this on your Facebook, <coughs> Twitter, Tumblr. Figure it out. You know, you know where to share it. You know where to do that shit. Um, and make sure you like uh, the DJ Hookup on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash the DJ Hookup and twitter.com slash the DJ Hookup. And you can also come if you need any kind of gear. We're all about selling DJ gear to our friends. And uh, on the subject of my friends, I would like to thank my three friends, four now, four new, new friend, friends, and Jordan. We never introduced Jordan, but she's the muscle. She's Jordan. the Jordan's, she's Jordan's the collector. Friend. She's the collector. She's she breaks your knees if you don't pay. Yeah. Um, plug yourselves. Where can people find you? Starting with you, Trentino. Plug what? yourself. Oh, plug plug in. Yeah. TrentinoMusic.com will link you everywhere. But if you want to go direct, uh, SoundCloud slash Trentino Music, Facebook slash DJ Trentino, uh, Twitter, Instagram, both Trentino Music, uh, and that's like the important stuff, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, bigones.com, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, big underscore once, O N C E. Uh, Trentino and myself also have a website together, big ones and Trentino.com, right? I think so. We got, I think we bought all of the We have a lot of, of those. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, bigones.com. That'll send you wherever you need to go. Um, links to SoundCloud, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, all that fun stuff. DJMapleSyrup.com. And if you live in LA, GratuityLA.com. Yeah. That's the goodness. That is the goodness. Yes. Amazing party. DJSleeper.com. And I feel like. Jordan should have our last nugget wisdom. Jordan, where, where can people find out about your your collection services, your your knee breaking services? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can follow me at J Sides with an extra S at the end. All that extra J Sides. Instagram. I don't have my own domain, but she'll put you on the money collection game. I will yeah. for sure. Thank you very much. Good night. Raw. Raw. <laughs>